Well, hello, folks. You know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I've got the best freaking job in the world because I get to hang out here every Monday night and talk to uh, poker luminaries. Uh, we're going to be hanging out with TJ Reed, no relation, uh, a little later on. But first, of course, I have to introduce myself. My name is Jim Reed. I'm Bluffsterini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter while we still have it. Um, but I'm just one of the folks here on the Wrecking Crew. We call it the leadership panel that runs everything that goes on here at Wreck Poker. Uh, you get used to hearing my voice because they let me uh, sit behind the mic on Mondays and host the show. But I'm just one small part of the magic making crew over here at Wreck Poker. And if you want to find out more about me and the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to wreck.poker slash crew. But don't take my word for it. You're going to hear from a few of them right here tonight on the show. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5v5 on threads or 5x5 five five in the Poker Stars home game. And I am John Somsky, also known as Poker, Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 just about everywhere. And uh, if you're going to be anywhere, uh, one fun place to be would have been Running Aces this past weekend. Uh, they are our longtime sponsor, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. Uh, we depend on their support. And we just had a freaking fantastic time at Rec Poker Weekend up at Running Aces. We played some tournaments. We played some cash. We gave away a ton of prizes. And we made a whole bunch of new friends. I I'm, I'm, I was really blown away. I got to meet a bunch of our Rec Poker members uh, for the very first time, including Chris Jones. Chris and I got to actually meet each other in the flesh for the first time. We've been doing this together for four years um, over Zoom only, but that was a real treat. And um, some of the some of the folks that are meeting us for the first time, if you're tuning in this week to the podcast for the first time, I want to say thanks for tuning in. And um, if you're one of the folks that gave us some really good suggestions for future podcast episodes some questions or some topics to talk about, uh, we record the forums edition of the podcast as well. We record those a few weeks in advance. So I, we're going to take on some of those excellent questions that folks gave to us uh, during the weekend. And those episodes will probably come out in September. So stay tuned for those. Uh, so I've thanked the Wrecking Crew. I've thanked the sponsors. Um, I know we picked up a couple new premium members th this week, but my flight got canceled. I just got home like an hour ago. So we are just going to dive right into the show here, folks. TJ Reed is a uh, uh, a talented poker player and uh, a writer for Poker Org, and we're excited to have him here on the show. TJ, thanks for taking the time today to join us here on the Rec Poker Podcast. All things goes to you guys. Thanks for having me. Love what you do. Uh, met a, a couple of you in person, and uh, so happy to join you. That's great, man. So um, one of the ways that I like to start these interviews, just uh, in case people don't know, who's this Terrence Reed who goes by TJ? Um, what? How, how would you define your own role in the poker world these days? If you're in the elevator and someone says, oh, you're involved in poker, what do you do? Um, how would you sum it up for them today? Sure. Uh, yeah, man, long story. But today, sum up short story is I work for Poker Org, which is an uh, online-based uh, poker media company. Um, I've had a few different roles in poker media over the last couple of years that have led to the one I have now. Um, I don't really have an official job title. We're kind of new. It's very amorphous, but uh, a hybrid reporter, I suppose, would be the best. So when I work from home, I do a lot of uh, written articles, feature stories, interviews with players, uh, event recaps, that sort of thing. And then I also travel a lot. I'm on the road covering different events. Sometimes we have contracts in place where uh, we meet those contracts by reporting and giving coverage to venues and events. And sometimes we're just covering big stories because that's what we do. And uh, so I'm on the road about half the time uh, traveling to cover those things. But then in addition to all that, I also play fairly full time. So full plate with uh, with po <laughs> poker one way or another. That sounds like the life, man. It sounds like you're living the dream. Uh, so I do have some questions about the, the nature of your reporting. But um, I want to sort of start just by telling telling our audience a little bit. Uh, about sort of how you got interested in poker, what your first steps into poker were like, and then we'll kind of tease out some of your your progression as a professional. Sure. Uh, I've always loved playing games. So I've 
I, I can't even remember the first time I played poker. So like way back when, but as far as like, let's get more relevant, more modern poker. When I was early twenties, I was cutting my teeth in, in St. Louis, um, which is, I grew up in Missouri. So um, there's a few casinos in St. Louis that have poker and I played mostly cash back then. Uh, I was working a myriad of retail and service jobs and didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life and trying to figure out all, all how to make money and how to survive in this world. And uh, played poker for the first time and just like there's almost a light bulb moment in the first week They're like oh I can play a game and make money doing so and you know it never even crossed my mind that it was possible um, and there's there's a few very good poker players in St. Louis um, that I connected with fairly quickly one of which I actually worked with at a restaurant that I was working at um, that kind of talked me through like what it takes of uh, keeping very realistic about making any sort of transition um, and I did so very, very, very gradually to where I was comfortable making that leap. Um, so started playing more and more poker, working less and less. Um, and eventually, you know, started making more money at poker than I was any of my other ventures. And it was really hard to turn down the opportunity to just jump into it. So uh, sometimes for several years, I did it as my only source of income. Um, several other years, it was, you know, mixed with other pieces of income, which in my opinion, is the best way to do it. But regardless, uh, it's always been a part of my life since I turned 21 and could step foot in a casino one way or another uh, for the past 14 years or so. So how did you decide, like, how did you uh, uh, transition from being a recreational poker player who was sort of making a little money and then decide that it, it was a good decision to go pro and have that be your your principal revenue stream. What, what, like, what were the benchmarks that you were hoping to hit, or like, how did you know when it was time to make that change? Well, to be well, I mean, to be honest, the the term professional is like hotly debated. Like, how do you decide how someone? There's no there's no governing body that determines whether you're a professional or not in this sport. So, like, really, anyone could claim that they're a professional poker player. But for me, it was just. I, I wanted to trust that I wasn't making a stupid decision. And so I treated it very much as a small business, uh, tracked mm. all of my results, tracked my hourly rates, made sure I, I got rid of some bad habits. Like when I first started playing poker, I was just an average casino goer. So I went and I played poker and then I met up with my friends at the roulette tables and then I right. had the black tables and then I ordered a round of drinks and, yeah. you know, it was just, money was flying in and out of whatever bankroll didn't exist back then. Um, so the really deciding factor was like, I, I started tracking my, my sessions, started getting a realistic of idea of how much I could expect to make uh, on an hourly basis uh, over a long course of time before, before I got rid of any other revenue source that was consistent um, but once I trusted it and I had a large enough sample size and I had a, a, a circle of friends that I could trust about what that process looked like, uh, then I figured I, I should just try it. To be honest, I was working jobs that were very replaceable. So it wasn't like mm. I was quitting some, you know, 10 year of pension based job where I, you know, I was working restaurants um, and stuff like that. So quit one, get another in, in a major city like St. Louis. So in my mind, it was jump in with a parachute because I had backup plans that could work. But once I trusted that, like I was going to make enough money pursuing this, um, I wanted to try it because I, to be honest, the love was there first long before any money considerations. I just really loved doing it. And so the idea that I could make some money was, was really appealing. Yeah. And I like the way you talked about sort of like, what is a professional poker player? Cause we, we got asked a lot in running at running aces this weekend. Like what is a recreational player? Like what, what is the definition of a rec? And I think that's something that's kind of changed a bit over time. I think, um, you know, relatively recently, uh, rec recs were just bad players. Like they were players that that were not very good. <laughs> and uh, um, I think we're trying to we're trying to take that back. We're trying to change that to just being that it's people that play for the love of the game, um, or people that don't continue that don't do it as their main source of income. And, you know, I think you can be a recreational player and still be a winning player. You can still make a lot of money doing it. It's just you don't depend on it uh, for a revenue source. And so I think when when people talk about what's a pro player, they really just mean someone who plays a lot of poker and doesn't have another job. Like, is that a, is that a fair way of putting it? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely one of the best definitions. You know, as somebody who's a writer, I care about what words mean as well. Recreational just means it's it's fun. It's it's yeah. what you do for fun, and professional means it is your job. Um, and, and there's no reason that there can't be an overlap there. Um, but you know, do you file your taxes as a professional gambler? Then you're a professional poker player, whether you made money or not. Um, mm. But if it is something you do just for fun and it doesn't really matter whether you win or lose, then you're a recreational poker player. And sometimes there's some gray areas in between those two definitions. But I like to think of myself, you know, I, I paid some bills with poker, but I still very much love poker. So I, I don't like using the term recreational negatively in any way. Um, it, it is helpful when you're trying to figure out, you know, the type of players you're playing against, perhaps. Yeah. It might influence yeah. your decisions. But as far as, you know, uh, pros, all pros being better than all recreationals, that's definitely not true. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think that's definitely correct. Um, so and I think you really hit the nail on the head. Like, I think the best way to enjoy poker is to have your play be one of many revenue streams where you still get sort of the pride and the pleasure of profiting from your hobby, but you're not like going to be unable to pay your mortgage if a heart doesn't come on the river. Like that seems like a really stressful way to approach this game that we all love, you know? Yeah. If, if uh, obviously, you know, don't gamble more than you can afford to lose. And, <laughs> and, and as much as I'll preach to anyone who will listen that I don't really consider poker gambling, there is obviously the potential for loss of money. And so mm. there is an element of gambling involved, but, but yes, it, if you're not, worried about the money if the results for any given session are irrelevant to your outside life then i think that's the best way to be as far as being able to play your best game not being stressed at night about where the money's going to come and and i know this is a privileged position to be able to say these things because not everyone even those outside of poker you know many people living paycheck to paycheck those sort of things that, that's a stressful condition to operate under just as a human being so Anyone who talks about playing poker, like I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Like <laughs> having a month worth of bankroll is not nearly enough because we've all been on the wrong side of variance. And if that eventually will catch up to anyone, and if that means you're out on the street, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So I'm gonna just going to take that segue to remind our listeners that um, we do a, 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 a raffle at the end of every show to support um, food banks in your area. You know, food insecurity is an epidemic that affects people all over the world, maybe even in your own backyard, maybe even your own in your own community. And you never know who might need a little help uh, putting food on the table for themselves or for their families. So stick around to the end of the show. Uh, you'll get a chance to win a prize for free. And it's just one of the perks of being here on YouTube. Another perk is you can type your questions into the chat uh, for TJ. So if you're watching along, uh, if you're one of our YouTube fans on Monday night and you've got something you'd like to ask TJ, just type into the chat there and we'll, we'll make sure we get it in here. So um, talk to me a little bit about reporting. So I'm always fascinated because I think like the the luckiest people in the world are the ones that have found a role within the poker world where they can get paid to do something that does not involve playing poker, you know, whether it's reporting or commentating, you know, facilitating things, uh, coaching, like there's all these ways that that people in the poker world can can scrape a living by uh, that don't involve the variance of playing. So how did you develop a role for yourself uh, as as a reporter, uh, as a writer, and were you a, were you a, a a writer before and just pivoted to poker, or did it all come up together? Uh, excellent question. I also agree. Consider myself very lucky. There's not a yeah. lot of poker media jobs out there in the world, um, so to have one that pays the bills is very nice. Uh, I started. This is 2023, so I started actually mm, spring of 2022. So not that long ago, and things have happened very quickly. Um, after, so I, I moved away from St. Louis a few years back and in that time went back to school for a writing degree. Um, this was during COVID. So everything was shut down. I wasn't playing much poker. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with that time and, uh, went back to school for a writing degree. And then, uh, as summer of 2022, 22 was approaching, I was trying to figure out some sort of writing internship, some sort of job I could have that would, you know, put something on the resume, once I graduated, because, you know, writing jobs aren't exactly being thrown around. Um, <laughs> and I uh, found, a, found a listing for Poker News uh, was my first poker media gig was reporting for the World Series of Poker as a, as a live reporter. 
and uh, went down. My first gig was actually shortly before that in May at the Lodge in Austin, Texas. Um, I just wanted to get my feet wet. Everyone said that when you jump in as a rookie reporter, it's like being thrown into the fire. You know, there's your 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 hands not being held and no one's watching over your shoulder in the moment. So you got to prove it really quickly whether you can handle it. So I was like, I reached out to a guy named Matthew Hansen, who's uh, one of the of the head guys in the U.S. for Poker News. And uh, he was like, yeah, let's get you down to Austin, get your, you know, jump in at a smaller event. And uh, I did that. Felt great about it. Very glad I did it. Because once I got to uh, WSOP in 2022, then I could just jump right in. Um, and I I know all the games even back then. So I know all the mixed games and they're very valuable because a lot of new live reporters, they either coming from a non-poker background or a non-writing background. And I was very lucky to come from both. Um, but also the poker background on its own, because it's very clear if somebody knows writing, but they don't know poker at all, it comes through in the writing. Uh, so I worked a full schedule that summer, which was one of the most difficult summers I've ever done. I was like, <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard it's a real grind down there. I can't remember how many days there were total, but I worked like 90% of them. And the six or seven days I had off for that summer, I just slept the whole time because those Smart. were 12 to 14 hour days. You don't get much sleep in between. You're waking up early to write the intros and the, staying up late to write the recaps. And, you know, you just don't really have that much of a life when you work a full schedule. If I were to go back or or somebody was doing it, I would encourage them to take maybe half a part time thing, like work maybe half the days or something. But I wanted to jump in and I was very confident and perhaps overconfident. Um but anyway, worked that whole summer. Amazing opportunity. Super grateful for that opportunity, to be honest. Um, first time spending the entire summer in Vegas. Uh, we got to play some cash games, but didn't really get to play much while I was there because I was working so much. Um, met some of my idols and icons, you know, people that I had grown up watching. The legends of the game, Ivy and the Grande, I'm standing 10 feet from them while they play poker. Um also trying to figure out the reporting side alone, but I'm just starstruck at the same time, trying to be a consummate professional and um, trying to make a name for myself in poker media. Uh, Along with that, obviously, I got to meet a lot of people in the industry and um, open up for opportunities down the road. Didn't really know what it would lead to, but I'm a big proponent of, you know, if you do what you love and you work hard at it and you prove that, you, you know, you work hard and you do love it, then it will open up more doors and um, by the end of that series, Eric Idelson, who's a guy that uh, is the head, one of the head guys for WSOP, and he hired everyone for the World Series of Poker circuit events. Mm. Uh, he came up to me and asked if I would be interested in working for the circuit. And I said, absolutely. I don't know what else I'm going to do. So I and I love traveling as well. So that meant I got to travel to circuit stops all throughout the fall and the winter uh, after the series was over. So I got to keep reporting for the circuit. These venues, these events are usually one or two people uh, doing all the media and all the reporting and all that. So now it's just all on your shoulders. Um, but again, traveling, meeting local rooms, seeing local venues and that sort of thing. Did that. And then by the fall of 2022, this organization named poker.org, who I'm currently with, they were looking for to, to ramp up their presence and hire more people. Uh, so I reached out to their editor, a man that I love, poker star's background named Brad Willis. He is the editor in chief for Poker Org. Absolutely love the man. And uh, we connected. We both grew up in Missouri, big St. Louis Cardinals fans, big poker fans. And he hired me on on a trial basis in November of 2022. I worked two months with them writing a bunch of feature articles. He liked my work and he brought me on full time in January of this year. Amazing. Uh, we've got our, our first question from the YouTube chat. Yeah, Brad's such an interesting guy. We're going to have him on the show uh, a little later this fall, I think. Um, so we've got some really, really cool things to talk to him about. Um, one question from Charles Allen asks, uh, were there any Canadian stops on your circuit tour? I wish of all the <laughs> places I have been, uh, Canada's got to be top of my list to go to that I've never been. I've never stepped foot across the Canadian border, and it is one of my life regrets at this point. Great poker played up there. Some of my good friends who come down to work for uh, World Series of Poker live up in Canada. Mike Patrick being one of the best. Yeah, he's a great guy. Specialist. 
just love that man so much. Um, but yeah, I'm open. I, I just, there's no excuse why I haven't crossed the border at this point. I've got a passport. I've got friends up there. Uh, so open to suggestions. Where should my first place mm. to play poker in Canada be? I don't know. I'm on the West Coast. So yeah. Well, come come oot and a boot up here, and uh, we'll see if we can find something for you. I know the uh, the playground is probably one of my favorite poker rooms in the world in Montreal. That's not West Coast, but um, I love Montreal. I love playground. I have still never had a losing session there, um, and so it's just like, ah, I want to go play there every chance I get. Um, and they have a lot of great – I mean, Charles is out in BC. Um, I know there's some uh, card rooms out there. Uh, there's some uh, in the prairies. We have a lot of decent card groups. I know there's a circuit event that comes to Calgary. I think um, every year in January. So maybe that's something you could uh, you could try out. But yeah, we'll we'll connect offline. Maybe we could get a get a poutine or something one of these days. That'd be great. And interestingly, full circle, you know, working with Poker Ord now. Uh, Poker Ord just took over. We had a huge presence at the World Series of Poker this summer. Yes, I saw yeah, that. Just- taking over live reporting for the WSOP circuit stops. We're the official partner for the World Series of Poker Circuit. So we're out in Cherokee Amazing. right now. I'm actually heading to Cherokee some, well, I'm going to go down to Sacramento tomorrow, fly out to Cherokee on Wednesday and uh, give some help covering their main event. So we're, we're doing that. We've got a partnership with the World Poker Tour. Uh, we're working on connecting with multiple other tours as well, bringing our live presence and reporting uh, to the live poker scene. That's fantastic. And good, I mean, good for you and good for Poker Org. Uh, I know we enjoyed um, having Gary on the show earlier this summer. And um, I really liked the first hand hands approach that you guys took to uh, some of the reporting the summer for the series. That was a really nice way to kind of get the the ground's eye view uh, of, of, of how some of the action was going at the series there. So congratulations, man. That's going to be great. And do you have... Um, now that they they go all over. Are, are there any like restrictions in your mind on uh, where you would or wouldn't go, or is it like a regional thing, or is it just send in the troops? Yeah, uh, send in the troops. We're we're going to cover every circuit stop. Um, it might vary how many people we send based on the size of the stop or the location of the yeah. stop. Um, but already this year, personally, I've been to I went at the Bahamas um, for. Um, PSPC yep. and the PCA. Uh, I was in Vietnam for the Triton event. So that pretty much covers about as far as you can travel. Um, <laughs> the, the circuit goes all over the States, obviously, and stretches slightly outside of it. We've got people currently in London um, covering the Triton event over there. We've got people in Cherokee and they just left uh, Choctaw. Um, so very much happening quickly and, and we've got a team that can handle it. But amazing stuff coming you know we're just shaking it up a little bit we're re- refreshing yeah. what poker reporting looks like and it's not just dry hand history so much as much as telling stories and, and finding fun stuff to, to share with the world because that that's the stuff that that you know it interests me and in general brad always tells us uh you know if, if it's intri- interesting to you if mm-hmm. it makes you know your ears pop then share it because other people will find it as well. More than just, oh, got ace king versus queens for 20 picks. <laughs> this guy exited the tournament. Congratulations, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, I know um actually we're I'm seeing here in the chat Charles Allen uh, uh saying that Deerfoot uh, is a great spot uh for the circuit in Calgary. Um Joseph saying Calgary in January, that seems cruel. Um <laughs> and uh Charles just pointing out that standard Canadians, we just stay indoors playing poker. Uh, which is true. It's not like we're playing outside, so you can you can figure it out. And if we ever do one up in Edmonton, they they literally have tunnels underneath the city, pedestrian tunnels, so that you don't even have to go outside in the wintertime um, because it gets awfully cold up there in Edmonton, Alberta. I can that was my dad. My dad was from there, and so uh, I can I can say it. so. Yeah, TJ, you just gotta wear a scarf. Just bring bring some thermals. You'll be you'll be fine. Come on up to the circuit in January. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Anyone that knows me knows I hate the snow and <laughs> greatly prefer to avoid the cold. Uh, I, you know, I'm in Vegas all summer. I'm now living in California where there is no snow. And, uh, you know, I could be convinced, but that's going to be a hard sell. <laughs> yeah, that would take that would take a lot of poutine. Um, so I would also be staying inside all the time for sure. Yes. No, but that's the savvy move. Like even exactly. even we do that. Don't don't split that. <laughs> 
Um, so what what's what do you like most about your current role? I mean, I just think the idea of tra- getting paid to travel around America, you know, playing a little, but but steeping yourself in the poker world. There's got to be a lot of cool things about that. What what's the one thing that you like or you really love about it? There's so many pros. Uh, two things that I always come back to. One, I'm working with a team that all love poker, which is incredible. Yeah. Uh, so, so everyone we talk to, you know, if you hear a story, they're like, "This is amazing." They're really passionate about it. Just, you know, got off the right before I uh, joined you guys. I was doing a, a, a call with Daniel Negreanu. Mm-hmm. We were talking about it. He just had the story last night. He he oh, dropped saw. His, his college yeah. game, right? That's super fun, yeah. Their home game. And, and, you know, two years ago, I couldn't imagine having a conference call one-on-one with d And now it's just, you know, my my Monday or whatever today is. Yeah. And <laughs> that's incredible. But but the thing I, I love the most is I, I love traveling and I love yep. playing poker. And this lets me do both of those things in a way that's very stress-free as far as financially, because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm a, they assign me places. Uh, we, you know, build my schedule, kind of get to pick and choose the spots that I definitely want to go to. And uh, the, as far as a live tournament poker player who travels a huge portion of your expenses and hence your bankroll is traveling hotels, food, that sort of thing. I don't have to worry about any of that. They they get me there. They put me up with the intention of working, obviously. Um, but oftentimes, like I'm going to Cherokee and I'm just going to cover the main event. And, and unfortunately, wasn't able to go before the main event this time. But oftentimes, I'll go a week early and uh, play a lot of the prelims. And then I'll switch and in, transition into work mode for the main event. Um, so I get I get to play and get to know the room, get to know the staff, get to know uh, the the players by sitting across the table from them and then the main event rolls around and I'll switch into coverage mode and then I and then I bounce away from the table and I get to cover them. So it's just really the best of both worlds. I I feel very lucky. Yeah, that sounds pretty sweet, man. Um I think I saw on Twitter you were um a bounty in a run good event uh, not too long ago as well. Now was that was that a mix of business and pleasure or was that just for fun? It was a mix. Uh, I stopped by Thunder Valley, one of my favorite poker rooms to play poker in the country. Uh, ben Irwin just does great things. He's the tournament room, um, poker room manager there. And they take care of their players. They take care of their staff. He does phenomenal. Um, but I stopped by there on the way down to Vegas right before the summer started. And he said, hey, you know what? After Vegas is over on your way back up, run goods coming. You should stop by. We'll make you an ambassador. Give you, you know, give you a gift card uh, to like play some golf or something like that. So I said, all right, cool. That's three months from now. I'm not going to think about that again. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, a month into the summer, I, I messaged Ben and said, yeah, I'm, I'll stop by. I'll, I'll play for a week. And he's like, yeah, we'll make you an ambassador. So I didn't really know what that meant. But what it ended up being is, you know, somebody who, who uh, represents poker in some way. And they uh, they recognize me for like being uh, at the WSFP all summer long and reporting with poker org and that sort of thing. But really it was just, I was a very, uh, F list celebrity, whatever you could call it in the poker <laughs> world. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Platt was there. Um, and Michael Longcar was there as ambassadors, several other names. So just people who are well known in the poker community, I somehow finagled my way in there um what what that really involved we we had an envelope and we wore a medal to identify ourselves and if you knocked us out of the tournament then uh, you got our prize um and i was knocked out oh i got it in so good too i'm not going to tell a bad <laughs> story but if there's one time i'm never mad about getting sucked out on it's when i'm an ambassador bounty and i get to give away a prize when i get knocked out Oh, I love it. And, you know, don't don't uh, don't believe the modesty. TJ is an excellent player. I had intended on inviting some of these reporters down to the MGM Grand uh, Rec Poker meetup game we had there at the end of June, thinking, let's get some of these industry professionals down. Let's get some soft money at the table. <laughs> and TJ just ran all over the table. I think he let like tripled up or something and then had to go uh, had to go do something else. Uh, but, yeah, he knows how to move those chips around the table. So there's no no doubt about that. That was a fun time. Thanks for coming out for that, by the way. That was a blast. That was so much fun. I wish I could have stayed longer. I actually kind of felt bad because I knew when I showed up, I could only play for about an hour and a half. We had another uh, event that I had committed to that evening. 
Um, and in that hour and a half, I turned 300 into like a thousand dollars. And then I was like, all right, bye guys. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's my recollection as well, TJ. Uh, but no, he did declare at the beginning that he had to leave after 90 minutes. It wasn't a hit and run. Didn't make uh, me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, I, also stacked, I also stacked Mo, one of our fellow reporters, twice, I think, in that hour and a half. And then yeah. we lived together. So that was an awkward night the next night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mo's going to come up again in this interview, by the way. But yes. All right. That's great. Okay. So, yeah, Chris, uh, you had something, I think. Well, you know, TJ, you, you mentioned uh, Poker Oregon and some of the kind of the storytelling and some of the sort of shifts in terms of approach to reporting. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated during the w- WSOP this year was having the sort of like the players kind of you had you had certain players who were just reporting from their table, kind of from their perspective, hands that broke down. Um, and I'm just I, I mean, it's really kind of interesting and fun to see this organization start to take some new approaches to reporting. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about what what are some of those what are some other ones that you're experimenting with and thinking about even going forward and how those went this summer how looking back at some of those approaches what are ones that you think um you know we're going to keep doing this because it really worked well or maybe there were ones that didn't work and we're going to just get rid of those yeah sure thanks for bringing it up and that's where our mindset is too. try new things see what works see what doesn't work there was two really uh there's two well-defined ones that we work with that you referenced one was first-hand hands, and that was basically we had a collection of players which started off as a small group and kept expanding as we made more and more contacts and people saw what it was, where the players themselves would send us hands that they found interesting. And we encouraged them to do so in whatever format they wanted to do, whether it be written text or voice or video. Um, And then we would do the work on the back end of converting that into our format of a first-hand hands report and they could provide whatever context they wanted, their thought processes, um, relevant information, chip stacks, that sort of thing. So instead of getting a reporter's view of what happened, you actually had the player's view of a hand and one that they found interesting. Um, so instead of trying to you know, hit some mark of how many hands to report, and so you get a lot of stuff that no one cares about, Alex Foxen messaged us and said, hey, I played this hand. I found this super cool. Here's my hand. Here's my thought process through this hand. And let me share it with you guys. And, and the way that looked on the back end is, you know, Foxen or whoever it was, we had many big name pros sending us hands, would, would message one of our people, their direct point contact for the summer and say, here's the hand. Here it is. We would type it up. We'd reply back to him with the our version just to get his eyes on it one more time. He would give a thumbs up of approval and then we publish it. And we did so through all, all of our social medias, as well as our poker instant page, which is um, kind of our live ticker tracker for all events. And we've got several of them on, on going right now on our front page. Um, so that was a way to get pros involved for them to do a lot of the work for us to make them look good. Um, and, and to also build their presence and their online fans. Um, so First Hand Hands was a big initiative that we took off with. Another was called Inside the Rail content, uh, which was the same thing that didn't involve hands. So it could be about anything that's happening inside the ropes on the felt from a pro's point of view. Um, Gary Gates had, uh, he did, you know, me and Gary were like pros that were, playing during the summer that utilize these features ourselves as well. Um, and so Gary had a one that I really loved. Like on the first day of the main event, he talked about how your table draw is so important. And he listed what he, you know, in the first hour of his main event, what he noticed from his table, how that's going to affect his play, how he adjusts based on who's at his table and how a table draw alone changes your entire tournament. So that sort of thing are the things you don't get when you just have like a fly on the wall reporter who are just reporting what they see. Uh, I like getting into into players' thought processes. So those two really worked. We're still fine tuning them and figuring out a way to make them even better than they were. But I like where that direction is going. Besides that, we're doing a lot more social media and video content um, instead of just pure text based stuff. So that allows us to to showcase emotions and happenings around the room that you just can't capture via text. And uh, if you're listening to this um, and you're not here in the YouTube chat, 
Uh, I will be putting some links in the show notes. There's a link there for Poker Org, and there'll also be some links for how to get in touch with TJ um, if at the end of this uh, episode you're still interested in talking to him. Um, so uh, we do have a question here from uh, Joseph Willis. Joseph was actually on the show uh, about a month ago. He uh, runs a fan. He and Tony run a fantastic uh, home game down in Las Vegas, the uh, Poker Oasis. Um, Joseph says. Any recent player stories of interest to share? Something that sort of stands out in your mind as being unusual or interesting uh, from the recent road trips? Uh, recent road trips. Let's see. I, I played the main event this year, which was the first time I had done so, and uh, had two players at my table that most people know. One is like the king of the win daily tournaments, Jeremy Becker. Who? Oh, yeah. Right. I saw that. Yeah. Jeremy Becker was two seats to my right. And then directly across from me uh, was Nick Palma, Nicky Mm. P. Mm -hmm. Um, And me and Nick tangled many, many times uh, throughout the event. And and he got kind of upset at me for calling him down in one spot, which I I think I played perfectly, to be honest. (laughs) Not to be results oriented, (laughs) but uh, yeah, that's right. So that was fun. Uh, the combination of the main event and playing with Nikki P. You know, Nikki P. gets a little bit of a bad rap, uh, sometimes deservedly so. He, he's a loud New Yorker um, who says, it, you know, speaks his mind and doesn't hold back on social media. But at, honestly, at the table, like he treated everyone really well. Um, without going too detailed in his hand history, like uh, he he opened up from under the gun and I called him in the cutoff with ace jack off suits, super deep in the main. And he flopped a combo draw and I turned I turned an ace unexpectedly and just called him down for three barrels. And by the end of it, he was like, how could you call? Well, well, who are you? What is this guy? This poker media guy coming in here. And he starts ranting just for like three minutes at the table. He talks to Becker. He's like, this kid couldn't beat you at the win fucking dailies. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. But it's one of those things where like he wouldn't do that if he didn't actually, you know, respect me. Yeah, if he yes. actually thought I was terrible, he wouldn't say anything. Probably that's what, yeah. or maybe he does hate me and thinks I'm the worst player in the world. I'm not sure. <laughs> but my read was that uh, we got along. Like from then on, whenever we see each other in the hallways, we give each other the poker player head nod. That, you know, while we're not inhaling smoke throughout the WSOP. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's great when you have those those friends and acquaintances that you can kind of give a hard time and it's it's meant with affection. But but you're right. You really can't be like that with everybody because sometimes, you know, sometimes people don't know that you're kind of complimenting them in a way or that, you know, you mean it well. And, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do is be a, a jerk at the table to someone, especially if they're less experienced, you know. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, so uh, we'll take that segue too. So. What what's one thing about uh, the current gig that you actually don't like, or that you wish you could change, or that kind of bugs you a little bit? Um, and I promise you, I'll keep it between us. Poker Org will never hear your answer to this, so don't worry. Please, sure. This isn't going out anywhere. No, no, you're all set here. Our dozen listeners uh, are sworn to secrecy. Yeah, honestly, I, I, it's really, and this isn't specific to my gig necessarily, but poker media as a whole is really difficult because. There's not a lot of money in it. Mm. Um, And so your ability to provide resources and content and the quality of site content and people on the ground is stretched very difficult. You have to have people that love what they do, not just the individuals, but also the company providing the reporting. Um, and, And I don't have an easy solution for it. But the fact that like, unlike other sports where money is coming in from the outside, it's just not the case in poker. The money is provided by the players themselves. And so it, there's not a lot of money for people doing the work and there's not a lot of money you know, for the companies providing the work. And so figuring out a way to, to deliver quality content without the money behind it, it is always difficult. So I know that no matter what we do, we're not going to please everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, we went down to to Choctaw this past first event for the World Series of Poker Circuit, and ninety five percent percent of the feedback we got was just astounding. Love what we're doing. Happy we're bringing coverage to the players that want them at the circuit. 
But then you have the 5% of people that speak up and say, you know, oh, where are my chip counts? Oh, this is how you're going to start off your reporting. This is not a great start. Like, I don't even know <laughs> who's still in the main event and that sort of thing. And you can't do everything. Like, we could spend our entire day counting chip counts. We could do that. Uh, but then we don't get all this amazing other content. And, and unfortunately, we can't have 10 people on the ground for every event because, you know, it just doesn't make sense unless you just want to dump money into something for, you know, and, and not get anything out of it. So uh, what I would change is I wish we could do everything. I wish we could mm. make everybody happy, but we can't. So we're going to pursue the stuff that we love and the stuff that we find interesting and, and giving attention to the good stories and, uh, you know, do our best. Yep. I've got a couple more questions for TJ, but if anyone on the panel here has any, feel free to unmute. And if you're watching along on YouTube, feel free to type them into the chat there. Um, so you've, you've spent a long time playing poker. You've spent some time uh, observing it and reporting it. What are some, and you, you know, we, list, we kind of uh, cater to the recreational player here. Um, what are some common mistakes or maybe just like one or two big mistakes that you see kind of less experienced players making? Because because usually when you see them, they're in big spots, you know, mostly the, the events that you're reporting on. That's usually recreational players. If they're in there, they're kind of taking a shot. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see people make that you wish you could just tell them, hey, don't do this? Um, Boy, that's a tough question. There's so many formats of poker, right? So I, I'm, I'm going to take this stuff that we play the most, which is no limit hold them and, and tournaments. Uh, I would say that one of one of the things I see the most often is being extremely loose and passive at the same time, mm -hmm. um, which is you see that a lot by people limping into the pot first. I'm not saying it's wrong all the time, but pretty quick identifier or somebody who doesn't play for a living. If you see them limping into the pot first and then not only that, but then calling after they do so. So they limp, a couple other people follow some aggressive pro raises and then they're going to call out of position look for a flop and, and usually the mindset that goes into it is oh i've got so many chips so i'm going to see a lot of flops right uh but those those you know limp call fold limp call fold uh, add up so quickly and you soon find yourself short stacked. Um, and and so I would encourage people to, if, if you're willing to put money in the pot, be the one in control of the pot. Try to find a way to be in control of what's happening rather than letting it happen to you. So by limping, by calling, by playing out of position, those things put you at a disadvantage in every way. Um, and, and, and so being a little more choosy about where we choose to get involved, who we choose to get involved with, why we're making the decisions that we're making, instead of just hoping that the flop bails us out. Right. Um, because occasionally it will. Occasionally you'll you'll flop to pair with your 10-8 suited from under the gun. Occasionally, you know, you'll flop a set when you put half your stack in pre-flop and, and then it doesn't matter, right? You get bailed out. But most of the time you don't. And you're you're going to bleed chips. So um, I would say play, a, a, you know, choose hands wisely, play aggressively, play in position, and be in control of as many pots as possible, so that you're in charge of what's happening and and you know when you're putting your chips in. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, if you're playing passively, the only way to win a pot is by making a very strong hand, and that's just hard to do. So if you're if you're the aggressor. You know, you give people an opportunity to fold and, you know, typically, you know, successful players is specifically no limit hold them are ones where other people are folding a lot. You, you know, you'd rather be the one applying the pressure than the one feeling the pressure. Yeah, it's hard to make a good hand, that sort of thing. And, you know, there's no hard and fast rules that are always 100% true in poker. There are absolutely spots that are OK to call or to take the passive launch. Sure. But you need to know why you're doing it. Don't make that your default setting. Otherwise, you will be giving chips constantly to the players who are more aggressive because when both of you miss a flop, they're going to win. Um, or, or when you make a hand that's good and they make a hand that's better, you're probably not going to be able to get away from it because now the, the pot is bloated and you're out of position and, oh, you got here with one pair. Why are you calling if you're not going to call this down? That sort of thing. So just 
compounding mistakes when you're being controlled instead of the one doing the controlling. So, no. and, and you can't really know when that's happening if you don't think about your hands after they happen. Mm. So that's the bigger picture is like, oh, talk, you know, write your hands down, think about your hands, talk to other pros about the way or other players that you respect that are of similar skill levels or better about how you played something. Because if you don't think about it after the fact, you're going to keep repeating those same things over and over and over again. And again, people play for different reasons. If you're just there to have fun, great. Like do what makes it fun for you because that's the point. And I'll never berate you for it. And I'll never judge you for it because people play for different reasons. But if your goal is to play as well as possible and give your chance self a chance to win, you have to review those things, identify where you're making those mistakes and, and, you know, plug those leaks in your game. Now, I can hear our listeners saying, oh, Jim, why didn't you ask a follow up question? So I'm going to ask a follow up question here. Um, You say that it it is okay to kind of take that passive line sometimes. Uh, What what are some of the circumstances where you'd say like, okay, this is like the textbook time to just call in position? Is it a question of the hands that you have? Or is it a question of some some aspect of the where you are in the tournament or something like that, or who the opponent is? What are those times when it's like TJ said I could call here? Uh, well, let's give a couple of examples. Let's say you have, um, a player raise from the cutoff, uh, and you have, uh, let's say a big stack raises from the cutoff and he has a super light, uh, wide range, right? And you have maybe 15 big blinds. This is a classic spot where most people would, would three bet any hands that they play. But let's say you have pocket aces on the button Mm -hmm. you know uh your goal is to get all the chips in the middle um so it's a great spot to maybe just smooth call and and, uh you know let the player see a flop and flop a pair that they can't get away from um that sort of thing Uh, another position another spot where it's not terrible let's to 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 see a flop is when you don't want to three bet because you don't want to get blown off your equity um, so you want to see a flop and players on your left are not three bet happy. So you're mm. confident that they won't be three betting you. So let's say, um, you're very deep stacked and a player from under the gun with a tight range raises like an older gentleman, for example, just to take, take, a, a what somebody that you expect to have a very strong range. Let's say he's got aces or kings and you just know it and you're on the button holding deuce, deuce. Obviously, you you should not be three betting here because you could get blown off your equity. <laughs> uh, but but calling is a great spot because you want to be able to get more chips later after you make your hand uh, under specific position. So if you're both deep stacked, the money is to be made after the flop. Whereas if you only have eight big blinds here, mm-hmm. it's obviously a terrible call because there's not enough money to make. So it's all about your, your how much your the stack that you have, the situational awareness to know whether you make more money by raising or make more money by calling in the long run. Not necessarily just this hand, but if you play this hand a million times, what makes you more money? Um, and then and then knowing what your plan is, um, both pre-flop and post-flop, no matter what happens. So every decision you make. You should be able to envision like the decision trees that branch off from it and which one gives you the best chance to make the most money long term. Yeah, great, great answer. Thanks, TJ. Um, so I've I've called TJ my uh, brother from another mother. Obviously, if you go back far enough, we're related by blood or marriage with that fantastic last name, Mr. Reed, by the way. Congratulations. Um, now, one thing, one reason I know that we're brothers from another mother. My mom actually tunes into the podcast every week. She's here in the chat today. Martha, I'm so glad that you're feeling better and you're able to tune in like you like you like you like to. Um, So my mom knows that when someone says, oh, no, I think all those videos were destroyed in a mysterious fire. That's not like a secret code for people to then go post those videos all over the Internet. So uh, I know that the, the, I don't know, the T stands for Terrence, and now I understand that the J stands for Judas. Um, what, <laughs> can, what, what are your thoughts on some fun ways to blow off steam in Las Vegas during the World Series of Poker, TJ? 
The T actually stands for traitor. So <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite ways to blow off steam in Vegas. Late night, you find yourself, you know, in a light filled room, music blaring, may as well bust out a microphone and sing some karaoke. And while you're at it, just you know, throw some invites out to some of your favorite people who are in the city. That's the best way. And don't forget your camera when somebody decides to dance. <laughs> And basically make love to the camera while they're at <laughs> gyrating hips and all, and then just spread that for the world to see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we had such a good time. Um, so TJ just put it out on Twitter. Hey, we're going to go uh, sing some karaoke tonight. If if you're a buddy, reach out. And we were just kind of getting to know each other at that point. But uh, I took the plunge and, and joined you and Abby and Jess and Mo and uh, Branson. We had a great time. Uh, drank a little sake, some beers, and I think we all, uh, you know, what what matters is that we had fun, TJ. You know, like we had a good time. Yeah, it was it was no, there, there were no judges in the room. You know, it wasn't a competition. We were just having fun, letting our hair down, blowing off a little steam in the privacy of, you know, select company was my thinking at the time. Little did I know. Um, so did you consider like a ransom note or something before you posted it? Were you like, so, Jim, you know, I'm just saying I got I got the goods here and you might not want to let this see the light of day. Did that even cross your mind? Because I would have paid a lot of money. Here's the thing. You can say what you want, but that camera was pointing at you in plain day. and You were <laughs> looking at it and you were pointing at it. So don't pretend like you didn't know what was happening in that moment. And that footage wouldn't be released. As far as the ransom note, I knew that Mo also had footage, so I had no <laughs> leverage over you unless we joined together as a partnership on that ransom. No, don't pretend. Uh, I don't want to hear all this. You knew what you were doing. You and you weren't drunk either. You had you had just shown no, up. Like this was, I was the opening act. <laughs> that was pretty early. You're right. You're right. No, and uh, if, if Mo, if you're listening, um, I, I can, I, I, you, I, for a moment there, I was considering you also to be a friend. Uh, but yeah, you guys, you did go into it together. And if people want to, I, I advise you not to do this, but if you really need to, um, you can check out TJ's uh, Twitter feed and you'll find a pretty embarrassing video of me uh, singing karaoke down in Las Vegas. Uh, having the time of my life with some with some wonderful poker people so thanks for the invite tj that was a lot of fun it was a great time uh karaoke in vegas is different than a lot of spots because you get private rooms so you can mm. invite whoever you want into a private room and then you sing whatever you want you don't have to wait for other people so we just went up there over and over and over just taking turns up on the microphone it was a lot of fun you you push a button and a waiter comes in and he brings you whatever you want and uh if you can't find the song in their catalog you can just pull up the youtube and and you know it, get the exact song that you want it's the way to do it in my opinion you know mm -hmm. you have to pay an hourly fee that you don't have to play at, at, at a public bar but instead of waiting you know an hour and a half in between every song you just get to keep pounding out the tunes and recording your friends embarrassing themselves it's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I i categorically refuse to retweet that video but it is out there if people want to find it um and it, it was it was a really good time um so i don't see any more questions so i'm gonna ask uh, the last one um tj you are you you've been a professional player you've been a professional reporter um you've been all over north america and you traveled around the world whether it's in the world of poker or just in the rest of your life, if you could look back and, and do, if you could uh, make do one thing differently in your life, what's, and it doesn't have to be like the biggest thing, but like what's one thing that you would honestly do differently if you could do it all, all over again? Oh man. Well, that question is going to lead to uh, opening up Pandora's box because hey, we got time. We got time. Well, I grew, I grew up in like a very, uh, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness in a very religious household, um, and, and I stayed in that religion long after I stopped believing in it uh, because mm. it's, it's very restrictive, and when you leave, you kind of lose your family and friends and all that stuff, so they kind of hold you hostage, and, and uh, so I felt like I wasted, uh, looking back, I feel like a, a few of those years were wasted where I could have spent them in other in other places, uh, getting into things that I actually love and that sort of thing. Um, so I eventually left and I feel great for it and I'm glad that I did so, but I would have left earlier because eventually after that, I got into poker and I got in, got into writing and I got into, uh, you know, living my life for myself. Um, so people, 
I think some of the best advice I ever got is, you know, you can be um, controlled by other people and you can be pushed to make decisions that you don't want to make. And this comes up in so many different parts of our life, whether it be what we go to school for, what career we choose, who we choose to marry or, or to get in a relationship with. If we're doing it because other people want us to, then we're never going to be happy or fulfilled or, or feel like we're living our best life. And so for me, when I started making decisions that I genuinely, truly uh, inside myself wanted to make, that's when I finally felt like I, I started living my life for myself and, and feeling fulfilled. So I'd probably make that decision sooner, but uh, wouldn't we all, you know, once we know what makes us happy and what we want to do, uh, you know, pursue those things quicker. So, uh, you know, the the path is the path. And sometimes it takes some people longer than others. Um, but if I could, if you gave me a time machine, I, I'd change it. But but as I sit here today, knowing that's not possible, I probably wouldn't change a thing. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that, DJ. And that's a great that's a great answer. Certainly, I, I know, like, I wish I'd gotten more into the poker world earlier as well. And I'd encourage our listeners, there's room for you here. You know, like, if, if you love poker, and if there's something that you want to do, you know, be a TJ, be a Kevin Mathers, like, just start doing something that you enjoy in the poker world. And, and you know, it takes a little luck and, and some skill. But if you've got both, and there's only one way to find out, folks. You got to go and try. Um, there, there is room for you in the poker world. And you know, uh, come, come join Rec Poker. Let, let us be the platform from which you jump. You know, like all it takes is just having a network, a community, friends that you can talk to, and uh, polish up your ideas. And iron sharpens iron, iron sharpens iron. So give it a try and throw yourself, throw your hat in the room. You never know. You never know what's around the corner. Uh, well, TJ, uh, we're going to put some links in the show notes for folks if they want to reach out to you. Uh, but like, don't share any sensitive information with this guy. OK, like that's what I'm saying. All right. You never know what he's, what he's going to do with it. Um, but where where do you like folks to reach out to you if they want to get more TJ Reed in their lives? Uh, most of where I'm at is on Twitter, which I've always uh, or X, I suppose, oh, these days, yeah. whatever that is. Whatever. Um, so given given when I started uh, reporting, I found out that everyone in poker was on Twitter. So I created my own and that's where I do most of my poker content. That's tj reed poker r-e-i-d just like uh, uh here on the zoom the best way to spell the name obviously yeah, the, the only uh, way that matters <laughs> <laughs> tj reed poker on twitter on instagram it's just tj reed one the number one um and then you can find me on poker.org my author a page is listed there on all the stories that i write and it uh you can be notified whenever i publish anything on there as well um, but yeah, thank you guys. Uh, my, a lot of my life now is dedicated towards growing this game and doing what's best, best for the game, getting it into more people's lives. I do so a lot of times on an individual basis, but also times, but also with poker org, but the fact that, you know, your company, rec poker, this podcast is dedicated towards doing the same thing makes us brethren, you know, makes us brothers, yeah. uh, not yeah. only in last name, but also in purpose. So much appreciated. Right on, man. Well, uh, let's connect offline over the next little while and see what other kind of trouble we can get up to together. I think we can uh, I think we can do a lot of good for the poker world. And it would be my pleasure. Sounds good. We'll see if we can get up to Canada. Uh, I'm sure there's karaoke bars up there, too. Yeah, we got a few. We got a few. All right. Thanks, DJ. Uh, that was a great interview. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. All right. Thank you all. Take care. All right. Well, we're going to do our food bank uh, raffle in just a moment here. So if folks want to start typing the words food bank into the chat. Um, you will be counted. Uh, and uh, I guess Chris is going to do his Daiso cam roll a little later in the show and see who the lucky winner is going to be. Um, I see there's some fun uh, comments in the chat here. Some some thanks and shout outs from the group. That's so kind. Thank you. Um, Martha has already. I can't. She's she's killing me here. She says, hey, where's Phil? She wants to know where's Philip tonight. Oh God, you're just like he's going to hear this, you know, Mom. You're just you're encouraging him with this kind of this kind of behavior. Um, so yeah, type the words "food bank" uh, into the chat there because you never know who might need a little help putting food on the table. It's uh, it, uh, honestly, you might be surprised who it could be from time to time, and it might even be someone in your own uh, your own neighborhood, your own community. So if you got a few extra dollars or some non-perishable food items or some hours to spare as a volunteer, if you just Google the words food bank near me, uh, you'll find a, a quality organization that could use a little help. And, and I hope you do. 
So uh, I get, let's just talk about running aces a little bit, guys, before we do the uh, the roundup um, of some recent home game results. So this was such such a fun trip. Um, the John Barrows, who regular listeners will know, is the uh, poker director at Running Aces. Um, he's been on the show a couple times. He told me that they did break another attendance record on Rec Poker Weekend. The Rec Poker effect is on. Um, so that was amazing. That's the second time we've broken Running Aces uh, attendance records uh, on a Rec Poker uh, event. So that was extremely exciting. Um, I went 0 for 3 in the tournaments, but I did have a pretty good weekend on the cash table, so I can't complain. But it was so fun. Uh, I just love meeting all these new folks and like some of the people that have been around Rec Poker for a long time. Uh, just don't get a chance to get together in person because we live all over the world or, you know, we have different schedules or that kind of thing. So I think um, I'll ask uh, John and Chris, you were both there. I'll ask you to share sort of what you thought was maybe the thing that you enjoyed most about it. For me, it was definitely just that 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 it is like a summer camp. It's like it felt like WSOP, like everywhere you look, there's a friendly face, someone that has, you know, you already have something in common with with this great love of poker. And um just t- talking to people about rec poker, man, we talked to a lot of people about rec poker. We've got some other, um, some folks that hadn't heard about it yet. And when I, when I talk to people who don't know about it, it really reinforces to me how amazing this community is and how much great stuff is available for you here as a free member, um, particularly as a premium member, but there's just with a podcast discord, um, Andrew's learning with partners program. We don't talk about that enough, but like we share amazing premium training content from a lot of other training sites out there because they recognize the recreational poker players are the lifeblood of the game. And this is how we're going to grow the game. So, um, as part of your premium membership, you get so much, so much value. We do like five interactive zoom or YouTube sessions a week. Uh, there's all sorts of book studies, uh, Eric's peel. Um, Joe and Kim and Keith all have their monthly review sessions. Uh, my own poker tracker for stuff. Obviously, Chris's deep dive is kind of like the flagship, uh, uh, program of what we do here. It is Chris. Um, you know, John runs 10 to 11 home games every week. I don't know how he does it. Uh, it's just so there's just so many great ways to get involved. And I hope, uh, I hope people give us a try for free. Uh, all it takes is an email address and a smile to sign up at rec.poker, uh, but both are mandatory. And if you use the code rec poker, if you want to go premium, you can get your first month for only $5. So go drop that five bucks and give us a try. Uh, I'm sure you're going to find something fun there. So that, that was, that for me, it was just meeting all the fun people and uh, uh, just getting to shake a lot of hands and hand out a bunch of pins and put some faces to names. That was, that was truly, truly a special experience. What about you, John? Uh, I just had a great time. I think it was about the last time I was playing poker at Running Aces was Rec Poker Days last year. <laughs> yeah. it, I just have been too busy this year, but it was great to get back out. I could definitely feel uh, I was needed to shake some rust off, um, and I was getting tired towards the end of the day, the day making silly mistakes. But you know, I made it close to the money i mean i got paid the same as the first person who went out but <laughs> i made it i at least got to play for a while yeah for the money and i was able to uh play some of the cash games and totally misread my hand a few times <laughs> oh yeah you punk oh my god yeah sorry maybe we'll get into that but yeah, yeah. but it, it was uh it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun <laughs> just to sit around the table and play and uh, I find I was doing it more for entertainment than for actual skill edge. So I need to work on that a little bit. That'll put more <laughs> money in my pocket than <laughs> taking it out of it. But it was a lot of fun. Oh, well, before we ask Chris about his favorite moment, um, let's just talk briefly about that spot. So we we set up a members only cash game after uh, the tournament on Saturday, and Chris and I, or uh, John and I, were in a hand together. And, um, I think it was, it was a single raise pot, right? And, um, I had, I had bet the flop with a combo draw, but I could have had top, or no, you bet. And I raised, you bet yep. the flop and I raised, uh, with a combo draw and you called. And then the turn well, came. And the flop and- was, uh, four, five, seven. 
Four, five, seven. That's right. And yep. I think I had I had four, six, or something like that. You had king six. Oh, I had king six clubs because it was there yep. was yeah I had a backdoor flush draw, and uh, John had six seven. So between us, we had wow. no between us okay. between us. So I I had we both had a six. Um, but I, I just so anyway the turn comes a seven, and uh, John checks I think. And mm-hmm. I figured, so I was semi bluffing on the flop when I raised you, but when the, when the top pair, when the top card pairs, I thought, oh, this is a good time for me to continue the story. I would do that with top pair. So I put in a very hefty bet on, uh, on the turn. And was that an all in or, or no, it was the maximum allowed bet here in Minnesota of $100. Right. Yes. Yes. And then, uh, did you, you, came back uh i i put all i shoved all in after that i did not yes. have a full stack so uh i was all in there and it was it was it was an, it was little enough that it was a pretty trivial call for me um and i knew i i thanks <laughs> no just because the amount <laughs> because of the amount of chips yeah and, trivial uh, to call me yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um i flip over my hand and uh, I've got king six, and I think there's still one card to come. So yep. uh, I was, I was like, okay, well, I've still got the combo draw, and maybe if a king comes, that's good. And John sort of proudly uh, reaches down and full, r- flips over his hand, confident that he's got trips because he had six seven, and there was a seven on the board on the flop, and then it paired on the turn. And then what? What happened there, John? What exactly did happen? Well, I flipped it over, and then somehow the cards magically changed <laughs> to be five six instead. <laughs> so you did and not. I was, fact, uh... right. I was just shocked, and I thought I had lost the pot. I I forgot that you know the five actually paired the board, and I was yeah. still beating Jim. But I could have sworn up and down I had six seven, <laughs> not five six. It. <laughs> And I thought, I thought to myself, as I, as I, as I went for the shove on the turn, I th- as, or, or the max bet on the turn, I said to myself, well, as long as he doesn't have a seven, I think he has to fold here. So I feel really good about this play. And, you know, John had the kryptonite. The kryptonite was not knowing that he didn't yeah. have a seven, you know, and that's how, that's how you, that's how you win some of these hands sometimes. So congratulations, sir. I, I hope you get to spend that on something fun in your brand new house that you're building that was uh, actually a, a session saver for me that means i was only slightly down when i finally <laughs> left the table <laughs> well it was a lot of fun it was so much fun playing with you i'm so we're gonna do this members only cash game i think at all our stops from now on just getting one table for rec poker members to play with each other you know and if you if you're not if you're new to cash and you know you're not comfortable with the casino environment um, this is the perfect place to come and just dip your toe and play with some friendly players like us. No one's going to give you a hard time if you make a mistake or if you string bad or if you make a bad play or something. You know, we're just going to laugh it off together. So um, I, I, I really like that some of the members that well, are a little less comfortable with that. Are you know, one of the out. things I found interesting is you find out that some of the members really do not match their screen names at all. Um, for example, we were playing with a really mad guy. Oh yeah, and he wasn't mad at all. He was no. delightful. He was. He was. So Aaron, I, yeah. I think uh, you cannot dox him. His oh, name is you. Mad Guy. Uh, I did it again. Yeah. Okay. Um. Sorry, Aaron. But he is, in fact, a delightful person. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I thought so too. And I, I finally got to get him those pins that he was so overdue uh, for, including that that silver pin, that elusive silver rec poker pin. Uh, Chris, what about you? What was your favorite part of the trip? Other than coming in, what, second or second in the first event, right? You did it. Yeah. Yeah. Came, you came I, in as a... a nice finish in the second event. Uh, so that was kind of fun. Um, in that event, I thought one of one of my highlights was uh, I sat most of my tournaments. I sat at the table with uh, our own Taylor Moss, Jinch, uh, Gopher Boy, TJM. And uh the and I, I heard you wrong, right? You said that was a nice experience. Well, it was because <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? I put out a very reasonable squeeze in a very reasonable spot <laughs> after Taylor opened and somebody flatted Taylor's open. And he 
uh, try. He just, you know, he was like, I, I'm going to call this with some, you know, raggedy hand. And the <laughs> poker gods uh, punished him. For it, and that felt really good. So um, I got to part of the reason I made that second place finish was thanks to Taylor testing that uh, moment. So that felt really good. Um <laughs> It was no, but in, in all seriousness, it was really good to uh, meet some of the members that I've never met before. It was great to meet Jim. Uh, the other yeah. Jim Gibber was there. It was great to meet him. The real uh, it was great to see some old faces that I haven't seen for a while. And it was, you know, I'm playing so much online these days. Um, I miss I miss the live thing. And I'm mm. so, uh, the other thing that I noticed about this. I'm just so mechanically not used to chips i'm actually yeah. i've got now chips on my desk i've been shuffling them while we're been doing the pie because like i just like forming a bet was like i it took me forever to do it and i would just so i just started verbalizing my bets and some of those kind of things so there was some some sort of like rust in the uh rust in the system there but it was <laughs> it was a really fun weekend um and I it was great know, to Chris. meet people I think you should just lean into it, you know. I mean, pick yeah. up the chips and say, "Now, which one do I bet here? I yeah, want to do." Yeah, 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 I mean, just totally just lean totally into lean it. In, yeah. Well, <laughs> and actually, I'll tell you the other highlight of my weekend. There was one low light was that uh, my this is not a bad beat story, but my queens got uh, sort of knocked out by this sort of like I don't know this kind of really raggedy player uh, by the, their their king queen player. And they (laughs) later came up and asked me after they had knocked me out of the tournament. Oh, are you still in the tournament? (laughs) (laughs) That's such a jerky thing. What a needle! It was was a real jerky thing. What uh, a needle! Oh man! Yeah, certainly not something that like the nicest guy in poker would do. In that player's defense. That player may not have had a very good memory that day and actually may have totally forgotten that spot. Fair, 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 fair. Yeah. Um, Taylor is uh, responding in the YouTube chat here. Uh, he just wants it on the record that he he was 70% to knock out Chris. And after that hand, he ended up soft bubbling the tournament. But yeah, congrats on second. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved. Um, but you weren't the only uh, regular rec poker member to do well. Um, Rob Adsum, uh, yeah, you might know him a as nice uh, uh, Captain Walleye, who plays third. And um, Daniel Kennedy, who is the only ever winner of our inaugural gold rec, pick, rec poker win, uh, also came in fifth in uh in the final event of the series so congratulations to all our members who made some money in there and had a great time yeah Yeah. and he actually will always be the only winner of our inaugural gold uh poker tournament win that's right and after hanging out with him all weekend i can assure you that we're going to hear about that about as often as we hear about taylor's inaugural player of the year win from 2019 it is something to brag about so i don't blame them Uh, So get used to hearing about gold pins and player of the year. It's just one of the perks of getting involved here at Rec Poker, you know. Um, And so, and and, and a side note, I want to thank Rob Adsum in particular uh, and his family for hosting me on Wednesday night. We got a chance to go and have some some fun playing cards. We had some beers, went out uh, on a boat on Lake Minnetonka. I got viciously attacked by several carnivorous sunfish that I didn't know you had in the lake there. They're that we don't have those kind of piranha sunfish up here in Canada, but boy, they 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 leave a mark. Uh, but that was a really really fun time. I always have a great time uh, hanging out with Rob. That's the second time he's hosted me because two years in a row now my flight has been canceled coming out of Minnesota, and I've had to make some scrambly last minute decisions um, this year. The, the guy that bailed me out was none other than Taylor Moss. I got a chance to spend all of um, Sunday with Taylor and his wife and kids. Uh, what a lovely family they have over there. And just in case you guys are wondering if Taylor is doing it right, he's he's doing so well. His house has two staircases. Yeah, there's like the staircase up the front and then a whole other staircase down the back. It's like very hoity-toity. So um, whatever whatever they're doing, they're they're doing it right. Um, Taylor, thank you so much. That was such a fun time. You were such a such a wonderful host, and it was great to to meet the kids. And I know that um, they they the kids the kids and I had a really fun time. But the guy that's going to get all the credit for that is their buddy Mitch, 
who they kept thinking I was. So I think we created some wonderful memories for the kids and Mitch over the course of yesterday. And uh, if I ever get back down there again, maybe they'll even remember who I was. Um, so, okay. That was all spectacular. And Chris, we're not going to get into it, but that last hand that we played together was also really, really fun. That was going to stick with me as well. Yeah, that was that oh, yeah. was a fun hand. More fun for you, I think. It was, it was definitely more fun, fun for me. Yeah, it was definitely more fun for me. Um, all right. So uh, we've we've gone all the way around the horn. Uh, why don't we, should we do the the roll? And then John Somsky is going to uh, tell us about some recent home game winners. So I, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the, Daiso cam and i think Hold chris we decided it was the uh the side view where the light comes okay, off it that I, really I'll, I'll try to get it once we get how many which uh, which uh which one am i picking here oh yeah so here we go so i don't see a lot of food banks in here i see luke uh charles joseph and joe and those oh <laughs> so yeah let's do four uh four for cider. those okay four this one's cider. gonna be the hardest of them all but we'll try yes it. Okay, let's see who's going to be. All right, are we ready? I'm, gonna, I'm ready. ready. I, I can see it. We got the Daiso cam. It's live. It's a four. Can you tell? Uh, yes, I can see it there for a second. That's definitely a four. And that is a Joe Rafter. So, All Joe, right. you know, send that email to info at rec.poker, and uh, you've won a fantastic prize that you will enjoy. And, Luke, you are. I see you in the chat there. I, I am taking your hint. You are so correct. I am way behind on handing out some of these prizes. And Luke, you've been such a good sport. We're going to give you two prizes. I'm going to set you up with two. I don't know if it'll be two of the same month for, for the same site or one month here and one month there. Uh, but I'll send you an email shortly. I promise. And uh, we'll make it happen. Thank you so much for your patience and your continued support. You're a really good sport. And um, <laughs> I deserve for you to make a lot more fun of me than you have been. So thanks, man. We'll we'll get you all squared up this week. Uh, John, take us down home game lane. And let's see who's been kicking butt recently. And then we're going to roll on out of here. And then I will. Oh, no, you get started. And then I'll interrupt you. Okay. Kek 65 Jacob Kiki, won the No Limit Hold'em Championship event. This is a, an event that we hold the first Wednesday of every month, and the player, it counts towards player of the year points. And regarding those points, Bone Crusher 14, Marcel Dusk, ah. has taken the POY lead. Ooh. So he is currently in the lead of the player of the year race. Nice. And Congratulations, now, Marcel. Now then KB has his fifth ah. nightly victory for the year. Jeff set or J Setum, Jeff S got his second nightly victory for the year. Aces 54, 320. Kathy Chang got her fourth nightly victory for the year. Well, and Kathy the actually, a sorry, let me just jump in here for a second. Yep. John. Uh, Kathy also, I think just came in second recently uh, to Kim, who also had a, a victory one point soon. Now that I've interrupted you, I'll also just mention, if you're listening to this live on YouTube, we're about to record the forums of the edition in about 10 minutes at the top of the hour, where, we'll, where we will be joined by Abby Merck, uh, who was the guest from last year or from last week. So we'll, we're going to be looking at a couple more hands from Abby. If you're watching this live and you're a premium member, come join us in the Zoom room. Uh, at the top of the hour, and you can have some fun uh, talking strategy with Abby. Sorry, John, you were saying, didn't mean to. Talk. I said, digging it, eight graves got his seventh nightly victory for the year. Hawsey eight got mm. his fourth nightly victory for the year. Cool. Duck and run 99, Michael Savage got his first daily mixed practice event victory for the year. Way to go, Michael. Elvis 76, Steve Kreps won the 8 a.m. international event. At, for his second international victory for the year. Mm. Now you said it, Joe Rafter got his first international hey, victory hey, for the year. He's on a roll. And then Pet Bet 33, Kim Kilroy, won the Daily LPP event the third time this year. Wow. So she can contact info at rec.poker for he, her free month at Learn Pro Poker. Amazing. And um, I want to shout out Michael Savage as well. Um, he and I have been emailing a little. Uh, he's down there in Texas. And I think we're, we're going to try and sync up uh, a rec poker road trip with one of the excellent card rooms in his area. So, Michael, thank you for putting all those excellent details 
um, in that email. That's really, really helpful. Um, now that I'm back from Minnesota, I'm going to sort of dig into some of that stuff and see if we can plan a couple other fun road trips coming up. I'd love to go play in Texas. So hopefully, hopefully we can set that up. All right, folks. Well, uh, is there anything else that we should mention before we roll on out of here? It feels like this has been a great episode. Um, Oh, yeah. Kim says she's going to donate that LPP uh, free month during her next hand history review. And I'm just looking at the calendar here. I think that is on the fourth Tuesday of every month. So we're looking at Tuesday, August 22nd at 730 Eastern with 630 Central, the only time zone that matters. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. Um, thanks for coming live on on YouTube and typing into the chat. It's uh, fantastic uh, to get this kind of live feedback as as we're going here. Um, thanks to the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, Rob, John, Chris, of course, TJ for being a great guest. And you, the listeners, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you all for what you do for Rec Poker. And we'll see you next week on the Rec Poker Podcast. Have a good night, everybody.